If you like rogue builds, especially if you like rogue builds that reliably get sneak attack damage multiple times per round, and especially if you like rogue builds that can get sneak attack damage multiple times per round, dealing damage to multiple enemies, then you're going to especially enjoy today's build. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week I take a deep dive into a character build for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that's both really powerful, but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you are thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby. I put these videos out every Tuesday. So if you like what you see, I would love it if you would consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there that says join. Uh, that way you get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate them yourself a little easier if you want to. Uh, access to the community Discord server, which is awesome. Even uh, access to the monthly live Q&A session hangouts that we have. So yes, huge thanks and shout out to my channel members. You guys are are amazing. I could not do this without you. And for everybody else, you're awesome too. <laughs> Thank you just for watching, liking, subscribing. These are all great ways to support the channel and I appreciate you just being here. So yes, as a reminder for those who have forgotten or maybe didn't know, the way the rules work in D&D 5e is that as long as they meet all the qualifications for sneak attack, if a rogue gets an attack with their reaction, that is, on another creature's turn, they can apply sneak attack damage for that attack as well as for an attack that they make on their turn, right? We're told sneak attack works once on a turn, not your turn. And for those of you who think this might be cheesing or that it's not supposed to work that way as per the designer's intent, I would ask you why they have said otherwise or why they originally changed the wording for one D&D so that it only worked on your turn, but then decided to change it back after the community grab their torches and pitchforks, right? A riot is an ugly thing. But I think that it is just about time that we had one! Anyways, I've done several builds to date trying to take advantage of this little trick, getting sneak attack with our reaction, including uh, the recent arcane trickster, as well as the less recent uh, quickened blade, among others. And every time I do a build to take advantage of like double sneak attack, I keep thinking that I've exhausted all of the ways that I can get it to work. And then eventually I always seem to stumble upon another. This time I discovered a way that I hadn't used yet when I was trying to think about how I would build a phantom rogue. One of my top two favorite rogue subclasses, for sure, right up there with the soul knife um, for just fun flavor and utility. Now. I've dipped Phantom Rogue once or twice, but I think the only time I ever went mostly Phantom Rogue was on the Berserker Lurker build, uh, which was quite a long time ago, and even then, I wasn't really building around what I think is the Phantom Rogue's coolest, most unique feature, Whales from the Grave. This feature lets you do some sneak attack damage to a second target once per turn, letting us build kind of a rogue cleaver, right? That is, a rogue who can do damage to two enemies on a Turn. And building a multi-target damage rogue cleaver has been on my to-do list for a very long time. But the problem with trying to really take advantage of Whales of the Grave is that it's only usable two or three times per day, until level nine at least, and for most of us that means most if not all of our character's career, right? And when I find a cool but kind of limited in use feature that I want to build around, it naturally kind of nudges me to think about the build as a burst damage dealer, you know, Nova damage, rather than sustain damage. So it gets me like looking for things in other classes that can augment our burst damage capabilities. And unfortunately, as so often happens with the rogue, once you start looking to other classes to augment your damage, it's hard to stop multiclassing since 
while sneak attack scaling is nice, it generally doesn't keep up damage-wise with things that you can get from other classes, extra attack above all. And yes, for those of you who are typing this in the comments right now, I have seen Triant Monk's double phantom build, uh, check it out right there if you haven't, and it's fantastic. I'm going to go a different route today, but yeah, it's a good one, check it out. Anyways, this is all to say that after the first few levels, we are going to spend a healthy amount of time with another class before we get back to Rogue. And after that, we'll even be dipping into a third class in order to really lean into the whole cleaver idea of doing damage to multiple enemies. I will promise you this, however. In order to still feel like this is a Rogue build, at the very least, I'm going to give myself a rule that I will never have more levels in any other class than I do in Rogue. Except at level 9. <laughs> but that's the only time. I swear. All right, so preamble done. I proudly present D&D build number 158, The Phantom Menace. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he came up with for this build. He does this for all of my D&D builds. He's such a great artist. If you would be interested in following him on social media to check out the other stuff that he's done or to potentially commission him so that he can create some art for your character or even your entire party, I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do so. But first, today's sponsor for the video is, once again, DealDash.com. Many of you are familiar with DealDash, but in case you're not, DealDash is an auction website that you're probably either going to love or hate. They've got thousands of auctions every day with brand new items where people have won auctions for insanely small amounts of money, like this iPad for $13.24 or this Xbox for $45. Bucks. But is there a catch? Yes, there's a catch. You've got to pay up front in order to bid. So. For example, you might sign up and buy, let's say, 400 bids for $30, which means you can now bid 400 times in any of their auctions. Every auction starts at $0 with no minimum reserve price, but every time you or somebody else bids on the item, it only raises the price by a penny. After you bid, the auction timer counts down by 10 seconds, and if no one else bids in the next 10 seconds, then you win the auction. But if someone else raises it by a penny, then the 10 second counter starts over and you now have 399 bids left, right? It can be fun, especially if you win. It can be frustrating when someone keeps outbidding you at the last second. For example, let's see. I'm going to bid on something here. What looks good? Taco Bell gift card. Hmm, some new sunglasses. How about, ooh, a $2,000 ladies watch. Maybe I could get that uh, for my wife for Valentine's Day. Let's see. All right, I'm winning. Come on, 26 cents. I'd do that. Here we go. Dang it. Dang it, Sergeant Angel. I want the watch. They've got all kinds of great stuff at Deal Dash. Uh, someone won a brand new Jeep for less than $1,900. Someone got a Nintendo Switch bundle for 22 bucks a while ago. So let's say that you spend all 400 of those bids that you buy, which again would have cost you about $30, and you don't win an auction. Well, you can use their Buy It Now feature and purchase the item at their fixed Buy It Now price, and they will return you the bids back into your Deal Dash account so that you can use them again to bid on more auctions. So is Deal Dash for you? It might be, but it might not be. Some of the auctions can take hours or even days to end. So you've got to have time to invest in bidding. Also, they don't ship internationally, so for those of you who are not in the US or Canada, you're out of luck. But if you like bidding on auctions and you've got time on your hands, you can get some pretty sweet deals. So check out dealdash.com slash D4. Uh, use that link if you would, I'd appreciate it. That way they know I sent you. And if you sign up, use my promo code D4 and you'll get 100 extra free bids on your first bid pack purchase. Also, if you don't win an auction from that first pack that you buy, or you don't like doing it for whatever reason, just contact Deal Dash. You'll get your money back, no questions asked. So if that sounds fun or interesting to you, then check them out. Big thanks to Deal Dash, and let's jump into the build. Right, at level one for our starting class. I think if you're going to play a rogue, unless concentrating on a spell is going to be a big part of your character's play, you really should start rogue. 
maybe even if you are planning on concentrating actually. I figure if you're going rogue, you're not just here for the damage. You're here to stealthily scout ahead, try and surprise enemies, find hidden doors, disarm traps, pick locks, etc. You're here for the utility as much if not more than you're here for the damage, right? And the nice thing about starting rogue is that you get one more skill proficiency for doing so than if you were to multi-class into it later. So let's be the best skill monkey that we can be while cleaving multiple enemies in two. As for our race, I'm gonna say let's go custom lineage with this one. I know some of you find this boring, though admittedly I never have. The nice thing about custom lineage, I've talked about this before, right, is that it kind of lets you make up your own race, right? Get creative, have fun with it. But I digress. Uh, the main reason we want this race, of course, is because of the free feat that is available to you if you take it. And for us, we are going to want to take Sharpshooter. That wonderful feat that tells us if we are making an attack with a ranged weapon, we can, just like Great Weapon Master, right, add 10 flat damage to our hit if we take a minus 5 penalty to hit. That's painful, but we are going to get some really nice ways to take the sting away from that minus 5 penalty, so don't you worry your pretty little head. Sharpshooter also lets us make attacks even at the long range of the weapon without suffering disadvantage like you normally would, right? And this is something we're going to be really grateful for on this build, actually. It also lets us ignore half and three quarters cover. It's a really, really great feat. As for ability scores, I'm assuming that we're going point by as always and say, let's take a 15 dexterity and then plus two from our uh, racial there, a 14 constitution and a 14 wisdom. For equipment, let's go the gold buy route and be sure to pick up some thieves tools. You're gonna need those as well as studded leather and as many darts as your money can buy. Yep. That's right, we're going darts. Man, I love this weapon. Ever since that old uh, Needler build that I did, I have used them in one or two other builds to date. I think, though, today is going to be my new favorite dart thrower. Until I make that giant barbarian dart thrower that I've got on my to-do list, anyways. So, why darts? Simple because they are the only thrown weapon that's also a ranged weapon. And for this build, we need something that qualifies us both. Why does it need to be thrown? We'll discuss that later. Wait a minute, you might be saying, wouldn't daggers work here? No, they wouldn't. Daggers and all other thrown weapons for that matter are considered melee weapons. Yes, you make a ranged attack with them, but they're still considered melee weapons. That's important because the sharpshooter feat only works if the weapon that you're attacking with is very specifically a ranged weapon, thus darts. So humble, so subtle, so effective. One note, as far as armor goes, later we will get proficiency with medium armor, so you might want to upgrade to that at some point, but keep in mind that most medium armor is going to impose disadvantage on stealth checks, and eventually we're gonna get our dexterity up to a plus five, and since there's no cap on light armor as far as how it can benefit from your dexterity, once we get to that point, our AC will be just as good with like studded leather as it would be with half plate, right? As a rogue one then. Rogue one. We get Thieves' Cant first up, which is just kind of the special coded language that those who speak it can use to send messages to each other. Then we get Expertise, which lets us double our proficiency bonus in either two skills that we're proficient in or one skill and Thieves' Tools. I think I'm probably going Perception and Thieves' Tools here, though it really is a tough call for me. I love being sneaky and stealthy, but we are going to have a better dexterity than we will Wisdom and Perception just comes up so dang often in game, especially if you're like looking for traps and hidden doors. So yeah. Finally then at Rogue One, there is no Rogue One. Well, there is now. We get sneak attack, which tells us that as long as we're making an attack with either a finesse or a ranged weapon, and we have advantage on the attack or the enemy is within five feet of one of our allies, then we get to add an extra D6 of damage to our attack. And that will scale with rogue levels, right? Now, even though when I'm crunching numbers, I'm not going to assume that we have advantage on our attacks. We will have some ways to get advantage if we really need it. And so I'm going to be assuming that we'll be able to use sneak attack on our turn when we need it, when we when I crunch numbers. 
So yeah, be sure to talk about this with your teammates and do your utmost to either like attack an enemy who has fairy fire on them or get help from someone's familiar or at the very least target the same enemy that your barbarian or paladin is standing next to, right? At level two, we get cunning action, which just lets us take the dash, disengage, or hide actions as a bonus action instead of an action. Super handy, always useful, awesome. At level three, we get our rogue subclass, our roguish archetype, and as I've said, yes, we are going with phantom. Phantom rogues get a couple of nice features. First up, whispers of the dead. This tells us that after a short or a long rest, we can choose a tool or a a skill proficiency that we lack and just gain proficiency with it until we decide that we want to use that for something else. Nice bit of skill monkeying there for sure. I love the flexibility. But my favorite feature, as I've said, is whales from the grave. This tells us that proficiency bonus times per day, immediately after dealing sneak attack damage on our turn, we can target a second creature within 30 feet and deal half of our sneak attack damage, uh, rounded up, to that second enemy as well. It comes in the form of necrotic damage, which is usually going to be worse for us than our darts piercing damage is, but that's okay. Still a fun and cool feature which will be great for either softening up or better yet, finishing off like an almost dead enemy while you get started on whittling down their friends, right? Speaking of, don't forget that sneak attack jumps up to 2d6 at this level, meaning that we would be doing 2d6 to our main target and 1d6 to our whales from the grave target when we use it. Finally, thanks to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, rogues get steady aim here at this level, and it's a really nice feature. It lets you use a bonus action to have advantage on your next attack, so long as you haven't moved and you're okay with your move speed being zero for the rest of the turn. It's especially good on ranged characters like like us who might not otherwise have sneak attack, right? So yeah, this is the first way that we'll be able to kind of guarantee ourselves advantage if we really need it. If we want to make an attack against an enemy and they're not standing next to any of our allies, we don't have advantage otherwise, well, now we can have advantage. And yeah, it's even better if you can be mounted since a controlled mount can move you around the battlefield without you having to use your movement, right? So you could use steady aim and the horse can move you around. So grab yourself a war horse or sure, a phantom steed. On this build, I've got other plans for our bonus action, at least during our Nova round, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't make use of this feature otherwise. But at level four, now that we've got some decent sneak attack damage under our belt and our first rogue subclass features secured, I think it's time to go fighter. It's inevitable, right, on a burst damage build. There are just so many wonderful things for us here, though, that we desperately need, not just action surge. I'm not talking about second wind, which is something we get at fighter one. It's great. It's just a little heal as a bonus action once per short rest. But the fighting style that we get at fighter one is one of the most important things for us here, because that lets us get the archery fighting style, which lets us add a plus two to hit to all of our attacks with ranged weapons. And again, darts are ranged weapons, so that's fantastic, really helping ease the pain of that minus five to hit from sharpshooter, right? At level five, we would be a fighter two, and that means action surge, of course, that feature that no respectable burst damage dealer should ever leave home without, letting us take two actions on our turn instead of one once per short rest. Infinitely useful. At level six, we would be a fighter three, and that means we get our martial archetype, our uh, fighter subclass, and we are thrilled to be taking that Jack of All Trades subclass, the Battlemaster. It is just the best. It really is. Because Battlemasters get combat superiority, meaning they have four superiority dice, which are D8s, that we can use per short rest to fuel our attacks, among other things, I suppose, uh, with wonderful combat maneuvers. Get to the chopper! We get to choose three maneuvers, and I'm going to highlight two that are essential for this build. First up, precision attack. This maneuver is incredible. It's one of the few things that's actually better mechanically in D&D than it is in Baldur's Gate 3. Take a drink. And let's be fair, there are actually a lot of things better in D&D than BG3. Spells, more classes and subclasses, the ability to do and say whatever you want instead of getting railroaded by the game, an admittedly fantastic railroad with branching paths, but still. Anyways, yes, precision attack. This tells us that we can add one of our D8 superiority dice to the hit chance of a weapon attack that we make, and we can even wait until after we roll to decide if we want to use it. So good. That's really going to help ease the pain of that minus five to hit, right? But the other one that I was most excited about using here, and that kind of was the catalyst for the whole build today, is Quick Toss. I gotta jump the decision, I have to toss me. 
I could have sworn that I had used this on a rogue build before, but I couldn't find it. It's perfect for rogues because, yes, it lets us make a ranged attack with a thrown weapon as a bonus action. No need to take the attack action beforehand, and this means that if we wanted to, we could quick toss a dart as a bonus action on our turn, even adding the d8 superiority die in damage if we hit, and then just take the ready action with our action. As a reminder, when we take the ready action, we simply state that we're going to do something when a certain trigger happens and what that something is, what we're going to use our action for when that trigger goes off, right? This could be something as simple as when enemy X takes their turn or moves an inch or does or says anything, etc., then I'm going to take the attack action against them. Doing that will require your reaction, but since it happens on another creature's turn, not yours, then you should be able to get sneak attack damage on that turn as well as on your own, and that's really freaking fantastic. One other thing that we're gonna wanna consider with Quick Toss, nets. I love nets. They're so weird in this game. You throw it, and if you hit, it does no damage, but a creature who is large or smaller is automatically restrained. No saving throw, no nothing. Now, they can often get out of the net fairly easily with either a DC 10 strength check or just dealing five slashing damage to it. That said, a lot of enemies in D&D don't do slashing damage, so especially if they don't have a very good strength score, or maybe you've got a way to lower their ability checks. Anyways, restrained means guaranteed advantage on attacks, among other things. So if we don't otherwise have an option for getting sneak attack because our allies are too far away, and for whatever reason we don't want to use steady aim that turn, maybe we've already moved, maybe we really need to move, maybe later we're going to get extra attack and we want advantage on both of our attacks that turn, right? Then yeah, carry some nets with you so that you can quick toss a net here and then make dart attacks with advantage. You'll miss out on the reaction attack thing going this way, unless you had action surge up, right? Then you could throw some darts, action surge, but then ready that second action, yeah. And so, yeah, depending on the enemy AC, you're probably better off going that route than getting two shots that aren't going to apply sneak attack damage, right? The weirdest thing about the net is the range. They have a normal range of five feet and a long range of 15. But since they're a thrown weapon, meaning that we'd be making a ranged attack, you'd have disadvantage if you were throwing that net within the normal range of five feet, right? Because you've got an enemy standing next to you and you make a ranged attack, or, within 15 feet, which is the long range, unless, like us, you took Sharpshooter. Hooray! And speaking of, yeah, darts have a normal range of only 20 feet, but a long range of 60, so we're super happy to have that benefit, even on our darts as well. Point is, start picking up some nets at this point if you haven't already. Capiche? As for the third combat maneuver to take, I'm gonna say pick your favorite, PYF. But if it were me, I mean, I might consider ambush, letting me add a superiority die to my stealth checks, especially if I didn't take expertise in stealth. But there are plenty of good ones to consider. I'm not gonna go into all of them. All right, at level six, it is time for our first damage report. This is what I think combat should look like for us on our Nova round. Right on round one, if you wanted. Simply quick toss a dart at your chosen enemy, take your action to throw another one, then action surge, and ready that action to attack them again, like right after the next player's turn or whatever. If you think you're going to miss either of those attacks with your actions, right, whether on your turn or on your reaction, go ahead and use precision attack if you think it's capable of turning a miss into a hit. When I crunch numbers, I am going to assume that we've got precision attack available, for those attacks, not for the quick toss, because you can't use two maneuvers on the same attack, right? But on the other ones, yeah. Each hit that lands will do an extra 10 damage from Sharpshooter, plus three from our Dexterity Modifier, with the bonus action attack doing an extra D8 of damage from our Superiority Die. Finally, on both our turn and on the enemies when we're making our reaction attack, we are going to be adding 2d6 sneak attack damage, and then on the attack that we're making on our turn, at least we'll be adding 1d6 more to a second enemy via will from the grave. Altogether, if all three attacks hit, it will add up to 3d4 plus 5d6 plus 1d8 plus 39 damage. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would at this level do 61 damage on average during our Nova round, and against a 15 AC it would be 45 damage. And okay, compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date at this level, that's good not great. Call it bottom half of tier 2, upper half of tier 3 by comparison, and Actually, because we're doing damage to two targets, though the vast majority of it could be single target if we wanted, we will pick up some second target capabilities later, so 
that's where I'm gonna stick them. And so yeah, compared to other builds in that tier, the multi-target tier, right, we're comfortably just kind of middle of the pack. But here's the thing, even though I'm calling this a burst damage build, we can be pretty dang sustainable here too. It's sort of a hybrid build really. At the very least, we should be able to get some decent burst damage a few times per short rest. If we're not using precision attack too often, and we're likely not gonna need to all the time, since we can wait until after we roll to decide if we want to use precision attack, right? We should have the ability to quick toss and ready action two or three times per short rest, adding that D8 of damage as well as letting us double up on our sneak attack damage on a round, right? And though we can only do whales from the grave, what, three times per day for now, that will increase as we level up to the point where we could get like several mini burst damage rounds, right? We wouldn't have action surge available except once per short rest, but otherwise we might be able to like quick toss, get sneak attack damage, ready our action, and then quick toss with our reaction for sneak attack damage again, maybe every round in a combat encounter. And that's just super cool. So even though it's not topping the charts for Nova damage dealers, it can kind of get like a mini Nova a lot more frequently than the majority of Nova builds, making the numbers here a little deceptive. Add to all of that the fact that we've got that wonderful roguish utility and this character is shaping up really nicely in my opinion. And of course it's only going to get better. And just a final reminder, if you really need to Nova but don't otherwise have advantage, just quick toss a net, make a dart attack with advantage now with your action, right? Heck, maybe even like piling on a menacing attack or something help you get a little extra damage, plus make them frightened. Then action surge, ready your action, and make another one doing the same thing. That's way better than quick tossing darts and foregoing sneak attack. It's not a lot better going this route than just using steady aim on your bonus action to get advantage, right? But the nice thing about a net is that it's going to have them restrained until their turn and they break out of it. So that means you'll probably get advantage both on your attack on your turn and on your attack with your reaction, right? And yeah, once we have extra attack, it's going to be a lot better using a net than steady aim. All right, at level seven, let's jump back into rogue. So we'll be a rogue four so that we can snag that ability score increase and finally bump our dexterity modifier up to an 18. Now we were at 17, so let's pick a half feet here. There are a few good options to choose from. If we wanted to just focus on damage above all else, piercer might be the way to go at least on the spreadsheet in a lab. You know, it lets us reroll one of our dice that does piercing damage and this can include sneak attack dice, uh, since sneak attack damage is of the same damage type that the weapon deals, right? Plus, it lets us reroll one more d6 if we get a critical hit. But the damage increase is so small with Piercer that I would much rather take Gunner here. Feels odd, because we're not actually using guns, but the feat is nice in that it lets us bump our dexterity by one, and lets us not have disadvantage on ranged attacks even if an enemy is within five feet. Anyone who has played a ranged character for any amount of time in D&D learns quickly that despite your best attempts to stay away from bad guys, sometimes they just get all up in your business anyways. And there's nothing worse than having to deal with disadvantage or risk an opportunity attack to get away, right, in those instances. Granted, we're a rogue, so we we could disengage with a bonus action and then scoot away safely, but if we could otherwise use that bonus action for something else, whether a quick toss or steady aim or dashing or hiding, then I would way rather do that. So not having to worry about the disadvantage if the enemy's close is really nice. One alternative to consider though here, I think, is skill expert. It's such a great feat. It lets you bump any ability score by one and then gives you a skill proficiency and expertise in a skill of your choice. So now we could have that rogue trifecta of expertise in thieves tools, stealth, and perception, which would be awesome. Focused on damage like I tend to be, I'll still probably take Gunner here, but if you want to lean into the skill monkey aspect of your character, you totally should. At level eight though, let's go fighter four so that we can grab the other ability score increase that's waiting for us just right there. And suddenly we have a capped 20 dexterity, perfect for both our damage and our roguish utility. But at level nine, yeah, this is the one level that I'm breaking my own like no having fewer rogue levels than any other class rule here. I mean, rogue five is great. More sneak attack damage, uncanny dodge. But I'm sorry, it just doesn't compare to extra attack, at least for damage. I am developing a great hope for one D&D that they do more things to make fewer attacks on a character more valuable. Know what I mean? Instead of giving lots of cool abilities and spells that do damage on every attack, like most things seem to be, I mean, yeah, keep rogues from getting extra attack, but 
bump up their sneak attack damage. Until then, finding ways to get more attacks will almost always trump doing more damage on a single attack will, right? So here we are, Fighter 5. This gives us extra attack, so now we get to make two attacks every time we take the attack action, including if we're holding our action to attack as a reaction. And especially when you're adding sharpshooter to each attack, it's just way better to get two more attacks over the course of a round than to add one more d6 of sneak attack damage, right? So, four, our level nine damage report. Since last check, we have added two to our dexterity modifier, capping it, and two more attacks on our Nova round, thanks to extra attack. It's been a very productive three levels. And so, against enemies with a 10 AC here, we would on average do 104 damage. And against enemies with a 16 AC, it would be 85 damage during our burst round. So, all right, we broke that century mark, at least at low enemy armor classes, and this puts us still kind of in the middle of the pack for multi-target Nova damage dealers compared to the others that I've done to date at this level. But there is a problem. We're not really much of a cleaver here. We get a little extra damage to a second target once per turn, what, four times per day right now, but that's it. So compared to other single target Nova damage dealers, we're about middle of tier three right now. Not bad, not awesome, but let's do something to increase our cleaver capacity shall we? In a minute, though, because at level 10, we're going to still be rogue. We're going back to rogue so that we can remedy that not enough rogue levels problem. Thus, we'd be a rogue 5, and we get uncanny dodge, which is a pretty nice defensive feature. Let's us take half damage once per round on an attack that we get hit with. The problem is, doing so requires our reaction, meaning no doubling up on sneak attack that round. That's okay. If it keeps you from being dead, you're still going to do more damage as a result, so use it when you need it, and when you haven't already spent your reaction to make attacks. We also do, at Rogue 5, get another d6 bump to our sneak attack, and since Wails from the Grave takes half of your sneak attack dice rounded up, that means at 3d6 now, Wails from the Grave is going to do 2d6 damage, so it gets a bump too, and that's really nice. But then, yes, at level 11, I think we want to take a Ranger dip, actually. You certainly don't have to. Maybe you don't care about cleaving so much that's fine. Maybe you don't want any of the other little goodies that we can pick up with some ranger levels as much as you want more sneak attack damage and the higher level rogue and phantom features. We actually will get to the best ones, I think, uh, for rogues and phantoms, uh, despite this little detour, but you might not want to wait, and that's totally fine. Let me explain why I want to take some ranger levels here, though. First of all, at ranger 1, we get the deft explorer canny feature. And that basically means expertise in another skill. So now we can for sure have that trifecta of perception, thieves tools, and stealth that I want on all of my rogues. And if we took the skill expert feat before, well, now maybe we could grab expertise in sleight of hand or investigation or maybe acrobatics. Fantastic. We also get favored foe at ranger one. And even though I like to complain about this feature, for us it's going to be a damage bump, even if a very minor one. So. I'll take it. With Favored Foe proficiency bonus times per day, we can basically mark a target and then the first time that we hit them with an attack on our turn, too bad it can't be on a turn, but that's fine, it will do an extra d4 of damage. I'd complain less about this feature if it didn't require our concentration, but at least it doesn't take our bonus action to cast or transfer like Hunter's Mark, so sure, we'll take an extra d4 on our Nova round. Why not? At level 12, we would be a ranger 2, and that means we get ranger spells. And yeah, sure, grab the nice defensive and or support ones, especially, I think, absorb elements, cure wounds, good berry. Entangle can be a decent control option. There's just probably nothing that I would plan on using here to bump damage, so I guess ultimately I'm saying PYF, pick your favorite. Hunter's Mark, yes, I know, it can sometimes be worth using, especially in a long fight where you're confident that you'll get multiple rounds of attacks on something, and or if you're like out of superiority dice and so you're not going to be needing quick toss, right? But at least during our Nova round or even mini Nova round, I'd rather quick toss and then hold my action than get an extra D6 from Hunter's Mark on two attacks. Because yeah, it's a pain in that it requires not only a bonus action to cast, but then a bonus action to transfer to a new target every time the initial target dies. We're just not making like a boatload of attacks here to really benefit from this, I don't think. Especially since we can get like the booby prize favored foe 
UFO instead with our concentration. It's only a D4 once per turn. It's not as good as D6 on all of our attacks, but again, at least it doesn't require a bonus action or a spell slot, you know? Another nice little perk about taking ranger levels, though, is that we get another fighting style. So let's go ahead and grab the thrown weapon fighting style so that each of our dart attacks do an extra couple points of damage. Not huge, but all these little bumps will add up. No question. At level 13, we would be a Ranger 3, and that means we get our Ranger archetype, our subclass, and this is actually the main reason I wanted to go Ranger at all, because we are going to take, yes, the Hunter archetype. Wait, what? Why would you not go Gloomstalker here? Gloomstalker would get us a bunch of nice things. Potential advantage in darkness, two more attacks on the first round of combat against enemies who hadn't gone yet, if we burned action surge, right? A bonus to our initiative rolls. It's clearly the more powerful subclass, mechanically speaking. The only reason you wouldn't want to take Gloomstalker here is because you wanted to be a rogue cleaver. Or maybe because you're freaking sick of Gloomstalker builds, right? <laughs> I did a Gloomstalker rogue fighter build already uh, right here am I out of cards in fact I've done two of them go watch those if you want to go that route it's a great route but here's the thing about hunters and about this build hunters get the hunters prey feature here which lets us pick a way to potentially enhance our attacks and we are going to take the horde breaker option because that tells us that once on our turn when we make a weapon attack we can make a second weapon attack against another enemy who's standing within five feet of the first and while gloomstalker is really great for nova damage on round one i wanted this build to be a two enemy focused build what's more we can do some mini burst rounds a few times per short rest. And Horde Breaker is potentially usable every single turn, right? An extra attack every round sounds awesome. Now, granted, you're not going to get that extra attack on a second enemy every single round because you're not going to have two enemies standing next to each other every single round. But won't it be great when you are in that situation to be able to whip out a quick toss, hitting both of them, potentially, thanks to Horde Breaker, then hold our action, and then with our reaction, hit one of them with a couple of attacks, and the other with some more sneak attack damage. I mean, heck, you could actually make one attack against each of them on our reaction as well, if you really wanted to, thanks to extra attack, right? And do at least some sneak attack damage to both. To say nothing of being able to, if we wanted, do four total attacks on our turn, if we have action surge, then two more with our reaction for six total attacks to split up against two different enemies however we want. I don't know. I just think it's a really fun and cool concept. Get your barbarian to grapple baddies to like bunch them up for you, or your warlock to eldritch blast push them together. I think when you can pull it off, it'll be a ton of fun. I'm just actually really bummed that we didn't get here sooner. We could have. My initial plan was to go Rogue 3, Fighter 3, then Ranger 3, and we would have been here by level 9, but yeah, leaving our dexterity at 16 without extra attack was super suboptimal numbers-wise. Go that route if you want. We're here now. Now, one finicky little thing about Horde Breaker that I have to mention. The wording on it says that we make the second attack against an adjacent enemy with the same weapon. I think the developers probably figured here that we would be either in melee or maybe using a bow of some kind. Thrown weapons make this a little wonky. I think there are a few ways to deal with it. Maybe our DM says, yeah, you've got like a boomerang dart or something. It ricochets. You know, you hit the first one so hard it just bounces off and it's the second. I don't know. Or maybe your DM says, I mean, a dart is a dart is a dart. As long as you're using a dart, it qualifies for the same weapon verbiage. Or maybe, best of all, uh, by this point, you've got a magic dart. I mean, we're level 13, after all. Magic items should be in play for most tables, right? And, you know, maybe you've got a dart that functions very similarly to the uh, artificer's infusion returning weapon, which just magically reappears in your hand after you throw it problem solved. I have a hard time believing that there are many DMs out there who would be like, nope, Sorry. While all other weapon users don't have to worry about this same weapon wording, you have to go run over and pick up the weapon that you threw, or like yank it out <laughs> of the first enemy that you hit because it's like still stuck in them or something, and then make that second attack for Horde Breaker, right? Regardless, be sure to talk it over with your DM and yeah, I suppose it goes without saying that a magic dart that does return to your hand after you throw it should absolutely be the number one priority here for you, magic item-wise. So talk about that with your DM, like, before you even bring this character to their table. If they're stubborn and they don't want to give you a returning weapon magic dart, then I really hope you have an artificer in your party who would be willing to trade one of their infusions. All right, for our level 13 now damage report... 
Since last check, we've picked up some more sneak attack damage, a little bump from Favored Foe, a little bump from Thrown Weapon Fighting Style, and then a what would be a sixth attack on our Nova Round to an enemy standing next to our primary target. And thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 147 damage during our Nova Round, and against a 17 AC, it would be 122. And yeah, that's nice. One of my favorite things about this build, actually, is the way we see really like strong, steady increases throughout as we level. It makes it feel like there aren't a lot of like dud moments, right? But again, it's just going to kind of keep us in the middle of the pack compared to other multi-target burst damage builds that I've done to date, maybe even on the lower end of that group a little bit. Which is a fine place to be, considering the fact that we've probably got two or three more like mini burst rounds in us as well, plus all the fun and important utility that we get to bring with us to the party too. At level 14, now that we've got the most important ranger features though, I say we go back to rogue to really bump up our sneak attack damage on both our primary and secondary targets, as well as pick up the other fun and important rogue features. So. At Rogue 6 here, that means we get another round of expertise, two more proficiencies to choose from here, and yeah, now we're really just the best skill monkey ever. And I would say grab Investigation and either Sleight of Hand or Acrobatics, I think. You'll know by now which ones are more important at your table. At level 15, we would be a Rogue 7, and that means we get Evasion, finally, such a fun ability, letting us take half damage on a failed dex save and no damage on a successful one when we're making dex saves against something that's going to hurt us like a fireball or a trap or whatever right and then yes sneak attack bumps up here to a 4d6 now though that's still only 2d6 against our secondary target from whales from the grave at level 16 we would be a rogue 8 and that means we get another ability score increase or feat you know with our dexterity capped a long time ago i haven't been worrying too much about picking up more feats here but sure there are always plenty of good options. I think if it were me, I'd probably be looking at resilient wisdom to keep us from getting mind controlled and things, or maybe just tough for more hit points, or sure, take ritual caster, get yourself a phantom steed if you can find a scroll for it, knock yourself out. But finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a rogue 9, and I really wanted to make sure that we got to rogue 9 in the build before the end, because as a phantom rogue, that means we get tokens of the departed. Super fun, super flavorful, pretty powerful too. It tells us that when a creature we see dies within 30 feet of us, we can use our reaction to cause a soul trinket to just boink magically appear in our hand. We can have a number of these trinkets equal to our proficiency bonus on us, and they give us lots of nice benefits. First up, advantage on death saving throws and constitution saving throws too. Very nice. Second, we can crush one and talk to the spirit of the creature who died to make the trinket, which is just going to provide lots of really cool and fun roleplay and story moments, I think, as well as potentially give us some nice utility. But then, then the third thing we get from this feature is that we can destroy one of these soul trinkets to immediately use whales from the grave without expending a use of one of our whales from the grave, right? We can do it proficiency bonus times per day. Now we can do it much more often thanks to these soul trinkets. And for a cleaver like we are trying to be, that's pretty dang awesome. It's so awesome that it almost made me want to try and get here sooner. If that second rogue subclass feature weren't so late, right? Level 9 is so long to wait. I was so excited when they were originally going to change this for one D&D. Anyways, yeah, the big problem for us with all of this is that it requires our reaction to make that soul trinket. And we are planning on using our reaction, at least during our Nova round, for damage. So it's a little tricky. Can we pretend that Whales from the Grave is basically sustainable damage now? We've got six uses per day of it as is, and then can hold up to six more, so long as we can use reactions to make them, right? I'm guessing that we'll be able to do that often enough, even without getting any cheesy, like, bag of rats shenanigans going. That's where you, you know, you have, like, a bag of rats that you carry around with you so that you can, in this case, uh, kill a few to stock up on your supply of trinkets, or, yeah, just, like, wipe out any local fauna that you might see on your journey so you can fill up your trinkets. Don't be that guy. <laughs> Anyways, yes, at this point, I'm guessing that you'll be able to do Whales from the Grave on almost every turn, and that's great. It just kind of adds to our mini burst damage cleaver capabilities. Finally, don't forget that Sneak Attack does get another bump here, doing 5d6 damage or 3d6 to our Whales from the Grave target. And so, for our final damage report. Since last check, we have bumped our sneak attack damage 
a couple of times. But beyond that, we've mostly added just some nice utility and defensive features, and we're not sad about that at all. But against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 167 damage. And against an 18 AC, it would be 140 damage on average during our Nova round. And yeah, that is actually the like mildest increase that we've seen all character from damage report to damage report. Say what you want about how rogues scale well because sneak attack, but even when we're getting sneak attack twice on our turn and half again to another target once on our turn, it just doesn't keep up very well with other features from a damage perspective. Anyways, it's not my fault. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> I know, there's more to the game than just damage. Anyways, compared to other multi-target Nova damage dealers that I've done to date, this puts us pretty near the bottom of that tier at this level. But keep in mind, that spreadsheet that I keep lists total damage, not damage per enemy, right? Some of those builds, I was assuming that we were hitting three enemies because there was maybe a big AOE spell that we were using or whatever. If you were to look at just average damage per enemy, we'd actually be a little higher up the chart. And that's important to know because, I mean, if you've got three enemies each that have 75 hit points, for example, I'd way rather do 75 damage to two targets than 50 damage to three, right? Anyways. Let's bring it on home here with some final thoughts. The tier score for this build, if you take the damage that they do at all of the armor classes we calculate for at each of the four damage reports and just average them all into one big number, we end up with a 91. And that puts us near the bottom of that multi-target Nova damage list, ahead of the Cantrip Blaster and just below the Dragon Monk, who again though was doing a little more damage on average but spread out amongst three enemies, so less damage per enemy. Me. Anyways, does that mean that this character is not very good? I would not say that at all. We have incredible roguish utility. We've got some solid defensive capabilities, and when the situation is right, we can actually throw down some multi-target damage with fairly high consistency. And that's the biggest thing that these numbers don't really account for. I've kind of talked about it already, but we could probably, by the end especially, use whales from the grave every single round. We can make an extra attack against a second enemy every single time they make the mistake of standing next to to one of their friends or getting unwillingly moved over to be next to one of their friends, right? We can do sneak attack damage twice on a round, a few times per short rest at least. I think this character finds a really nice kind of middle ground between solid sustained damage and burst damage. And you know what? I think for that very reason, this might be one of the most fun rogues that I've made yet. Because every round isn't going to just be the same, where you're basically just trying to hit whoever you can get sneak attack on and then rinse repeat next turn, right? That variety where you're getting a few moments of some extra juicy, bursty damage would be a lot of fun to play with in game, I think. And would hopefully make it fun for your allies too, as they position the enemies around the battlefield in order to get some extra damage and attacks off. All while you get to live your best sneaky lockpicky roguish life. So I certainly hope that you get to try it out in game sometime, but that is the build for the week. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. You are the best. I hope you have a fantastic day and a great week. And if you don't, I hope you'll hang in there. I believe that you can do this. <laughs> I know that feels a little parasocial, but I really feel that way. I hope that you will do good and be kind, and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care, bye. Listening to Greta Van Fleet earlier today at the gym. Thank you, by the way, Dallin, for introducing me to that fantastic band. If you are a fan of Greta Van Fleet, you are also a fan of Led Zeppelin, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, and vice versa, because the two bands, like the DNA for most of the songs, anyways, are like 87% the same. <clears throat> and that's not uh, an insult, by the way. Um, I love both. But yeah, it took me a long time, I think, to realize like just how nerdy uh, Led Zeppelin really was, right? I mean, come on, that song I was just singing, or the bass line for, anyways, Ramble On. Cause in the darkest depths of mortar, I met a girl so fair.
But Gollum and the evil one crept up and slipped away with her, 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 yeah. They're always talking about misty mountains and all kinds of stuff. Love it. Ramble on. I gotta find the queen of all my dreams. <laughs> You're welcome for the Greta Van Fleet recommendation. They are an awesome band. And yeah, they share like 90% of their musical DNA with Led Zeppelin. They're really great. And yes, like you pointed out, Led Zeppelin is a very nerdy band that has a ton of Tolkien references. But did I ever tell you, Colby, about... The one thing I have in common with Robert Plant. So uh, when I was a kid, I moved around a lot. And when I was in, I think, fifth grade, I lived in a very small town in Idaho. And I was miserable. No shade to anybody from Idaho. I just don't do good with small towns. And, and I was struggling with the move. I was a kid, you know, trying to make friends and whatever. But one weekend, I found a stray puppy. It was like a black border collie and it was like my best friend for that weekend i played with it every day um but monday came around and i had to go to school and i had to take the bus to school but the puppy chased the bus all the way to my school sat outside of my school and waited then chased the bus all the way back to my house just so that it could hang out with me it was the greatest dog ever and um in fifth grade and still today obviously i'm a, i was a huge nerd and i loved lord of the rings and i loved led zeppelin and so i named that dog Strider. And so Robert Plant and I both have that in common, a love of a dog named Strider. Doobadoo. <laughs> Shiny foreheads and focus. Oh, it is warm in here today. I think the AC might not be working and it makes me sad. Is it 158? Maybe it's 157. I can't keep track of my builds. Do -do 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 -do. 158. Okay. Oh, update for Discord. <laughs> Come on, there's a slow update. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, My friend um, Jeff Child and I used to listen to that song, Ramble On, um, in the car all the time, and we could never quite figure out what the noise was that's like playing in the background throughout the whole song. It's a little percussion sound. It sounds like a little like that. And I think the closest we ever got was like a basketball. I swear somebody was in the recording studio with a basketball between their knees and just like tap it, tap it, tap it, tap it on it. Cause I don't know what else it could have been. Oh, not her. Wait, is that true? Half plates of 15 plus two. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I get the same enemy that you're barbart. <laughs> oh wait, no, this is not the feature that I love. I mean, it's nice. I'm not slamming it. It's just, it's just not the one that I was wanting to talk about there. Um, okay. You know what? Don't say any of that. <laughs> Need a drink. Let's see. Speak, speak with dead. Speak to, well, don't even worry about it. Oh, I took two Benadryl to help me sleep last night because I wanted to make sure I got a good night's sleep for once. I don't know what's worse, getting a bad night's sleep and being tired or being hungover from Benadryl. <laughs>